semester, we are going to run the Saturday Science series, uh, basically focused on astrophysics, gravity, cosmology, trying to answer questions about what happens inside the stars, how the guy should be the first talk today. The next talk will be about the very birth of the universe and what is beyond it. Then the talk after that tells us about how galaxies form. And finally, the talk will be on exoplanets, like where the possible uh, alien life can be. So today's star is Manos, and he is a young professor who joined LSU three years ago. He finished his initial work in Greece, and then he moved to Texas to do his PhD. Uh, he finished his PhD in 2013 on astrophysics and on stellar phenomena. Then he did his postdoc at University of Chicago, and then he joined LSU in 2016. And his most of the work is on what happens inside stars, and he answers these questions using supercomputers, and he's one of the main experts on supercomputing in our Department of Physics. And I'll give this to Manos now. Thank you. Thank you, Rafa. I'm, uh, I'm really happy to be here, and I'm especially honored to see such a young crowd. Hopefully, by the end of this talk, a lot of you young people will get so excited about astrophysics that one day you will revolutionize the subject and use even better computers than I'm using today. That's my wish after today. Also, I hope you're going to take it easy on me because today, I don't know who follows LSU football, I do, and today we're playing Texas, and Texas is my alma mater, so it's a, it's a very hard day for me, I don't know. <laughs> so please take it easy on me for that. So, and with that, we're going to start uh, our discussion about things in the sky that come and go, things that blow up and then disappear. And why do we care about those things, those stars that die by these really violent explosions we call supernovae? And why are they important? Why do we study these things? What do we learn from studying the deaths of uh, massive stars? But before I start, just a brief introduction. As Param said, originally from Greece, we come from a long standing tradition of astronomers. The father of astronomy was Greek, Hipparchus. Here is Eratosthenes from 276 BC. It's a bust, of course, uh, not a selfie like this one. And Eratosthenes was the first astronomer to measure the uh, size, the radius of the Earth, the size of the Earth. And then a few years later down the road, you see there's still a few Greeks that care about astronomy. Here is me in a beautiful uh, Miami. So this talk will be about things that come and go far away in the sky. But before I start talking about stars that explode, they get really bright and then they disappear. I want to start with a few things that are probably more familiar to your daily experience. Here's one example of something that comes and goes. Fireworks. You know, everybody loves Fourth of July fireworks. You go out there and uh, enjoy the spectacular show and usually what happens, you have something that goes up the sky, blows up and then disappears. Think of it as a transient phenomenon. You're going to hear me using the term transient a lot in this talk. This is a more formal thought, uh, term to describe things that appear and then disappear in the sky. Another example is asteroids. In some cases, you got space rocks or asteroids that enter the Earth's atmosphere. And in the process of entering the Earth's atmosphere, they flare up, they get really bright, and then, of course, they die out, they either fall in the ground or they burn completely in the atmosphere and they disappear. So that's another example of a transient phenomenon that you may be aware of. There's some more earthbound examples. Sometimes humans in the backyards, they do really dumb things <laughs> and things come and go. So you get something that becomes really bright and then somebody that falls on the floor falling dead. And you get famous movies like the epic Star Wars movie, which in this particular scene depicts the, the explosion of the Death Star. This this massive weapon that Darth Vader wanted to use to destroy entire planets in the movie. But also, some things in life that come and go are also one big wonder, like this song. So this is an example of something that comes and go. It's a crazy phenomenon, and you just get brick roll. I don't know, the young people in the crowd probably don't understand that joke, but the older generation probably does. So I want to start by asking the crowd how many people in this room have driven away from the city lights of Baton Rouge or New Orleans in the wilderness and looked up in the sky in a dark night without a moon? How many? Raise your hand. How many people have done this little trip, field trip? Okay. For those of you who haven't done it, I highly recommend you do. It's a beautiful, it's a spectacular show. 
You can see it almost every night and it's free. You don't have to pay for it. It's right there. And if you do this, uh, you will see this beautiful band of stars that crosses the sky, which we call the Milky Way. And you will see stars of different colors, of different brightnesses and luminosities. And you may wonder, you know, you may ask yourself, people tend to ask a lot of questions when they look up in the sky. You know, an obvious one is, why are some stars brighter than others? Why, for example, this star up here is brighter than this star down there? Is it because this star is closer to us and it looks brighter? Is it because this star is actually intrinsically bigger and brighter than this, this other star? The answer is more or less both, but it turns out astronomers, what astronomers can do is look in detail and figure out how big those stars are and how far away they are. They can measure those things, and that's a hard thing. Measuring how far a star is might sound, might sound trivial to you, but it took a long time for people to figure it out and do it accurately. And that is important because the first step in understanding how big the universe is, is measuring distance. Something like, you know, you take, you take it for granted, you know the distance from here to, to New Orleans is you know, approximately 60 miles or so, it takes you an hour to get there, but that's not as trivial. Figuring out the distances to stars is not trivial. But the other point I want to make, just looking at this picture, is that, as I said, some of those stars are bright, some of those stars are dimmer, some of them are closer to us, some of them are further away from us. But if you look at them closer, what you figure out is that most of the stars in the night sky are pretty much like the sun, our own star, the star that gives light to our planet, the sun that we see every day, which we, we very uh, nicely blocked from this room today is a star, and most of the stars in the Milky Way galaxy, in our galaxy where there's hundreds of billions of stars, are very similar or actually smaller in size than the sun. It turns out about 5 to 10 percent of the stars that I showed you earlier are really big. They're 10, 20, 30 times bigger than the sun. And it turns out those kinds of stars, those massive stars, they live a very interesting, short, and a very interesting and violent life. Especially towards the end, they, they end their lives by a really violent explosion that we call supernova. Now, why am I showing this beautiful picture of a beach? What does that have to do with anything? Because it's an analog. If you want to talk about how many big stars versus how many small stars you have in the Milky Way galaxy, it's kind of like talking about how many big rocks versus how many small grains of sand you have at a beach. You have way more grains of sand, smaller rocks, than you have giant rocks like this one, for example, at a beach. Stars in the night sky are pretty much the same. There's a lot of them like the sun, or smaller, but there's a five to 10% of the stars that are really massive, and they tend out to be extremely important for life in the Earth. And I'm gonna to try to convince you why that is the case. So here is a, uh, a selection uh, of things that come and go, which in astronomy we like to call transient phenomena. Now, I'm not going to talk about most of these things. I'm going to focus on this particular type, the deaths of massive stars, supernova explosions. But I want to tell you that there's other things, a lot of things, that come and go like fireworks in the night sky. And we're only able to find these things by using some of the biggest, the most modern, the most expensive telescopes, both on the ground and in orbit around the Earth, space telescope. So you got, for example, occasionally you might have a star that comes really close to this supermassive power of the universe we call a black hole. And if they get too close to it, they get completely disrupted and they flare up in the process. In scientific terms, we call this a tidal disruption event. What really happens is you have a star that gets really close to a monstrous force of a black hole and gets, gets ripped apart. You have other things, like I said, comets and asteroids, uh, another phenomenon which is stars bursting out material from their surface called the nova outburst, but I'm not really going to talk about them. I'm going to talk about the deaths of massive stars which I'm calling supernova explosions. Now, what is, I don't want you to be scared by this diagram. I'm going to explain to you everything about it, so don't, don't be terrified about this whole crazy scientific things here. But what I want you to take out of this is that when astronomers are using telescopes to find things that get bright and then they disappear, 
there's two things that can basically measure, right? The first thing is how bright it gets. You know, over time a supernova will get brighter and brighter and brighter. At some point it will reach maximum luminosity, and then it will start fading away like a firework. So we'll, this the shape of this evolution of light as a function of time for, for supernovae, we call it a light curve in scientific terms. And it turns out it tells you a lot of things about what's going on. First of all, the two numbers that we care about when we actually go out and find these things is how bright they get. This is the maximum luminosity a supernova can reach. How bright they get and how long it takes, how many days, because those phenomena happen in the course of days. Sometimes they happen in the course of months, right? Um, how long it takes to get to peak luminosity. Those are the two numbers you can measure. You just stare at this thing for days and you measure, okay, how bright is it today? How bright is it tomorrow? How bright is it after tomorrow? And then you see how long it takes to get really bright. So this is what we call a light curve. This is perfectly summarizing what a transient phenomenon is. It's something that comes and goes and fades away. Now, again, forget about all the scientific jargon. What I do want to point out here is that if you look at this previous diagram here, again, you can measure how bright something get, gets and how long it takes to get that bright. And if you look at many things in the sky that does this, there's many different, as I said in the beginning of my talk, there's many different things in the night sky that become bright and then disappear. And then if, if you want to put them in this plot, which basically tells you, okay, how bright do I get versus how long do I take to get get that right, then you find that there's a, a particular category of phenomena, which we call luminous supernovae, which are extremely bright. To give you perspective, at peak luminosity, a super luminous supernovae is as bright as one trillion times the sun. So if you go out there and look at the sun, try to multiply this by a trillion, and this is how bright super luminous supernovae really get. Now, how do we find these things? Well, it turns out that we're using some of the most cutting-edge technology to find these things. Because you're not going to go out there most of the time. You're not able to just go out there in the night sky and just stare at the sky and, and be able to say, hey, something is going on right there. I found a supernova. It, it can happen. But for the most part, if you want to find some of the most interesting things that go on in the sky, you have to use telescopes. And you have to do it in a manner that's very fast. That is why we built automated robotic telescopes like this one in the picture in the bottom right which automatically scans the sky and takes picture if you have an iPhone you've probably take a, taken a burst photograph with your iPhone before it kind of does the same way it just takes bursts pictures of the night sky and then it compares each picture with the immediately previous picture because if you compare two pictures together then you can see if something is different if something is changing and that's what it does. And it does it automatically. It's fully automated. It's like a little robot that scans the sky and then immediately sends an email to astronomers to say, hey, we found something in this part of the sky that wasn't there before. If we think we found something interesting, then we can use some of the biggest telescopes available to study it in more detail. And this is the picture right here. So this little telescope that I just showed you working in real time in the bottom right picture is housed in this nice little dome which uh, is in West Texas, uh, Fort Davis, where the McDonald Observatory is. And some people like to call it R2-D2 from Star Wars because it looks kind of like R2-D2. But in the background, you have one of the biggest ground-based telescopes in the world, the Hobie Everly Telescope, the HCD, which will then receive the message from this little guy that, hey, I found something. And it's going to go and look at it in much more detail. It's going to be able to magnify the image many, many, many times more and take really high quality observations of this thing, which will help us understand what kind of supernova is going on, what kind of star exploded, in other words. Now, it turns out the next year, a taxpayer-funded project cost about half a billion dollars, which is called LSST the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, will be able to do the exact same thing as this little telescope I showed you, but in much higher accuracy and way better. It's going to be able to find hundreds of thousand times more supernovae than this previous telescope. To give you an example, it's expected that this 
this design that's, com that's coming online next year will discover more than a million transient events in the sky every night. The universe is a big place, there's billions of galaxies, there's lots of stars that do crazy things, they get bright and then they fade away, and this thing is going to be able to find a lot of these transient events, millions of them every night. Now, if you find millions of transient events every night, it's really hard to analyze them with human <coughs> power. Like, you can use as many students, graduate students, as you want, but you're never going to be able to understand every single one of those things. The only way out of this problem, which we can do today, is to use artificial intelligence. So this is an example where astronomy even branches out to things that traditionally you haven't thought of. When you listen to the word astronomy, you think about people looking through a, an eyepiece of a telescope at the sky and looking at the rings of Saturn, most likely. But what astronomy is today is at a place where we have to employ really, really sophisticated methods like artificial intelligence. Another term for it is machine learning. We teach computers, we train computers to find and identify those things in the sky because there's just too many of them. We can't do it by hand. That's what this project is going to do. It's going to revolutionize the field of transient astronomy, as we call it. Now, to give you an example of a type of supernova that I care about is what we call the Corcolat supernova. This Corcolat supernova basically characterizes the death of a massive star. If a star is more than 10 times or 20 times or 30 times more massive than the sun, the life of this star is not going to be as quaint and long and more or less stable as it is for the sun. Of course, we're very grateful that the sun is this way because we wouldn't be here for a long time. But the stars that are really massive, they're fast and furious. They kind of go by the James Dean saying of live fast, die young. That's what really characterizes massive stars. And at some point, as they grow older and older and older, they get hotter inside the, in their cores. They get hotter and they get denser over time. And that allows them to fuse more and more elements. What do I mean by that? Well, if you look around you, you can recognize a lot of materials. Some of them are made of iron. Some of these materials are made of silicon, carbon, oxygen. Your body contains a lot of carbon, a lot of uh, oxygen. You may ask yourself, where is this coming from? Where is the oxygen in my body and the, and the carbon in my body coming from? And it turns out that it's, it's produced over long periods of time in the hearts of these massive stars. So that is, what, that is one reason one of the many reasons why we care about this subject, to go back to my original argument. We care about massive stars and luminous supernovae because they are places in the universe where the conditions get so extreme, the temperature, the density get so ex extreme that you can actually form some of the most common metals in the universe that we see, iron, for example. But it turns out even a massive star cannot go further than iron. Once a massive star produces iron, iron is a special element in the periodic table. Once a star makes a core of iron, that's the point of no return. There is nothing the star can do to sustain itself against gravity. Because that's one other thing you have to remember when you look at stars, even when you think about the sun. You may ask yourself, why is the sun shining? And I literally mean it. Why is the sun shining? The reason that it stays in one place, the reason that it stays together, is because you got two competing forces. One of them is gravity that's trying to pull everything inwards, the same force that causes an apple to fall from a tree. It's trying to push, to smash the star inwards. And the other one is what we call pressure, which is applied by nuclear fusion, nuclear reactions in the heart of the star that produce the elements I was talking about. If this balance is broken, one of the two competitors is going to win either gravity or pressure. If gravity wins, everything's going to collapse down, down the center. If pressure wins, everything's going to expand away. So in this particular case, when a massive star makes an iron core, it cannot fuse any more elements anymore. It has no pressure to sustain itself against gravity. So it's going to collapse, and it's going to collapse in a very violent way, the core of the star is going to collapse. That's why we call this supernova core collapse supernovae. The core of the star is going to collapse in a violent way, and that's going to produce a, 
a really powerful explosion that's going to rip the rest of the star apart, producing a bright firework, a supernova. That's going to get bright and then dim away over a period of days. Now, the core of this star will keep existing, will keep contracting. The rest of the star is blown up, produces supernova. But the heart, the core of this star, there's nothing to stop it from collapsing against gravity. So it will potentially create some really mysterious things, some of the most mysterious things in the universe. You've heard about black holes. That is the way to create black holes in the universe, by the collapse of the, of the core of the massive star, or neutron stars and other things. We're not going to talk about those things in this talk. We're just going to focus on the explosion that takes place that essentially enriches the universe, enriches space around it with these newly produced materials that we can find in our human bodies or our watches or anything, your phones. So let's just start by some simple questions. How bright are supernovae? I I've been telling you through the entire conversation so far that those are some of the most explosive, bright phenomena in the universe. How bright are they? And I want to give you a perspective that you can probably understand. So everybody in this room potentially pays uh, for electricity, unless you're using solar. Good for you. But if you're using regular electricity, you're dealing with uh, Louisiana Energy. And Louisiana Energy charges about two cents per ki kilowatt hour for the electricity you use in your household. A typical supernova explosion, like the one I was talking about in the previous slide, produces 10 to the power of 35 kilowatt hours. What does that mean for people that are not familiar with these numbers? Take one and put 35 zeros after it. That's how big, that's how much energy a supernova is producing. That's a lot. To give you a perspective, if you wanted to use the US power grid to, to run, to power a supernova on your own, it would cost you one billion, trillion, trillion dollars. Or as I'm jokingly say here, of course, 1% of the global debt. That's not true. That's a lot of debt in the world. So, uh, and you can reverse the question and ask, okay, if I could harvest the entire energy from a supernova, how long would it, it sustain the US power grid? The answer you would get is one billion, billion years forever. So one supernova can actually power every single home in the United States for eternity, essentially. That's how bright and how powerful these events are. Now, what we do very often in science when we talk about things like this is we produce animations that can give you a picture of what's going on. And this is particular animation. What we're doing is we're diving inside a massive star in the moments before its core collapses to produce a supernova. And as you can see, you got different, different circles that uh, have different colors. Those different colors correspond to different elements that your star is producing. But eventually, when it produces an iron core, that's the end of the story. And this massive explosion takes place, and the supernova is expanding in the surrounding space. This is what we call the supernova ejecta, the ashes from the supernova explosion that expand in the surrounding space. And the core of the star might do something else. As I said before, the core of the star will keep contracting, and it may form some of the most mysterious and extreme objects in the universe, like black holes. Now, a lot of your parents, and myself included, were probably alive back in 1987. And 1987 was a very important year for people that study supernovae. The reason is that the very first supernova that was discovered that year, that's why we call it SN 1987A, supernova 1987, the year of discovery, A, the first supernova we found that year. That year, we found the supernova that happened unprecedentedly close to us. Typically, the explosions of massive stars, the supernovae that we find, are really far away. They're in other galaxies. They're not even in our own Milky Way galaxy. Some of the uh, supernova actually happened in our galaxy in the past, in the distant past, and we can see what's left over. But for the most part, the explosions that we find today with our telescopes, like the one I showed you earlier, they're not in our Milky Way galaxy. They're really far away. This one was very important because it blew up in a neighboring galaxy. Has anybody in the room traveled to the Southern Hemisphere, New Zealand, Australia, or something? OK, if you travel to the Southern Hemisphere, the sky looks entirely different than it does 
here in the northern hemisphere of the Earth. If you travel to the southern hemisphere and you look at the sky, you will distinctly notice two cloudy concentrations of stars in the sky that are called Magellanic clouds. Because the great explorer Magellan observed them on his way of trekking around uh, the Pacific and the Atlantic Ocean. And what these things are, they're other galaxies. They're smaller galaxies that orbit our own Milky Way galaxy. They're neighbors to our own Milky Way galaxy. And that's where this explosion took place in 1987. It took place to a neighbor galaxy, so it was close enough to study this thing in unprecedented detail. So we were able to actually go back and look at historic pictures that we've taken of this part of the sky, because it turns out there were, there were a lot of telescopes that took pictures of this particular region of the sky before the supernova exploded. And when they did that, they found this star that was there. If you go back and look at the same place, that star is not there anymore, well, because it blew up. It became a supernova explosion. But if you go back to these historical pictures and you find the star that exploded to produce supernova 987A, you can understand a lot of things about a star. And that, that's one of the way we confirm that a lot of these things happen from really massive stars. You know, you got, uh, we found the star and we measured its properties in the historic images and we figured that it was a giant star. It was a really massive star. Also, what makes the supernova very special, and I'm not going to go into the technical details of that because it can get a little complicated, but what makes the supernova really special is that how do you prove the theory that I just told you about, right? That you have the core collapse of an iron core that reverses into an explosion, blowing the star apart. Okay, that's a theory. We see supernovae, and that's what we think causes that. But how do you prove it? Well, one of the predictions of this theory is, is that as a product of this explosion, you will produce a very mysterious particle that's called a neutrino. And this particle, it's a subatomic. It's really, really small. It's a very, very small particle. It travels with the speed of light, like light itself. And it doesn't interact with matter, which means that it can go through the Earth within a second, and you're not going to feel it. It goes through your body. Billions of neutrinos go through your body every second. Don't worry, it's not going to hurt you. It doesn't interact with anything in your body. It's too small and too light to interact with anything in your body. Now, it turns out that when a supernova happens, if, if the theory is correct, you have to produce a lot of those neutrinos. Well, we've built, back in 1987, we've built very special detectors to find those things that we did. We found for the first time supernova neutrinos from 1987A, which provided great support for this core collapse theory. Now, the other thing about this supernova, which we, we've been following up with our most powerful telescopes over the last 40 years or so, you can actually see it evolve. That's the beauty of it. Because Back in 1987, guess what? We had the Hubble Space Telescope in orbit. So we could use the most powerful space telescope, the Hubble Space Telescope, post it, uh, uh, point it at the supernova, and follow what happens in great detail, because that's really close to us. And if you look at this picture that I have down here, this is what you see if you, if you look at supernova 987 today, approximately 40 years after the, the explosion, 42 years. You see this really weird elongated shape in the center, which is essentially what's left over from the supernova, the supernova ejecta expanding. And around it, you see those blobs of material. What is this? What is this ring of clumpy material around the supernova? That's weird. You would expect a star to be surrounded by this pristine, nice, clean space environment. In this particular case, it wasn't. In this particular case, is something around the star that flares up following the supernova. We're going to talk about it more. This is what I, like. I really like this video because it's a movie that was taken for the last for the last 40 years. It's Hubble Space Telescope staring at this supernova for 40 years. So you can see it evolving. And if you look at this movie over the last 40 years, you will notice that this ring of material around it gets brighter and brighter and brighter over time. What is going on? That was a big puzzle back in the day. Why do you have this 
ring of material around the star, why does it get bright after the supernova over time? Well, the logical explanation here is that after the star explodes, and you get the supernova ejecta, the supernova ejecta rams into this material, collides with this material that's been there, flaring it up. That's the idea. We call this circumstellar interaction. I don't want to use too many nerdy terms like this, but what that means, circumstellar is around the star. Circumstellar interaction. You get the interaction of supernova ejecta with this material, and that's causing this to flare out. But that also is a puzzle in itself. OK, fine. How did this get there in the first place? It was a eureka moment back in the day. Like We don't really understand massive stars as we thought we did. And that's the beauty of science. You build better telescopes, you build better computers, you get better data, and you always push the envelope further. You find something new that you thought you understood, but it comes on and completely ruins your theory. So what's going on? Yeah, what is this material around this stuff? We're going to get back to that in a few minutes. Before we go back to that, I also want to talk about a different kind of supernova. And the reason I want to talk about it is because it led to a Nobel Prize discovery back in 2011. Now, the previous type of uh, supernova explosion I talked about, which I called core collapse supernova, was um, uh, dealing with the death of a massive star, a single massive star. Well, it turns out that another surprising thing we found out over the last 20 years, most of the stars in the sky, they're not single. They also like to find partners somehow. So more than 60% of the stars in the night sky have another star, a partner star. And they dance together in space. They go around each other for a long period of time. Sometimes their, their relationship gets pretty bad. It happens to humans, it happens to stars. And they start interacting with each other, sometimes to a breaking point, which causes a massive explosion. So it turns out this is a different kind of supernova than the supernova I was talking about so far. The core collapse supernovae are coming from the deaths of massive stars. These, as we call them, thermonuclear supernovae, or type 1a supernovae, are coming from the death of a special kind of star, which is called the white dwarf, because it interacts with a companion star. This inter interaction leads it to explode. Turns out, because this particular type of star, this is of course an artist's depiction, the particular type of star that explodes, which we call a white dwarf, has very standard properties in physics. The explosion is very similar. So if you look at many type 1a supernovae in the sky, of this kind, they look more or less the same. They get to the same brightness, it takes about the same time to get to that brightness. They look pretty similar, which means that astronomers can use them. And they're also very bright. By the way, those are 100 times brighter on average than the other kind of supernovae I was talking about, the core collapse supernovae. But if something is really bright, you can find it at really great distances in the universe. Because it's brighter, you can see it far away. Now, turns out that this gentleman back in 2011, Saul Perlmutter, Adam Rees, and Brian Smith, some American uh, astronomers used this special kind of explosion to measure, because it's so standard, you understand its properties, you know how bright it is, you can figure out how far away it is. So they measured hundreds of thousands, thousands of uh, type 1a supernova in the sky to figure out how big the universe is. And the, to figure out the properties of the universe itself. Because if you can measure distance at really, really great distances in the universe, you can say something about the geometry of the universe. So they used this particular type of space boom, this type 1a supernova, this thermonuclear supernovae, to measure distances and constrain the properties of the universe. You've probably heard about the Big Bang Theory. You've probably heard about that the universe is actually expanding and accelerating. Well, that was proven partially because of this discovery by using this particular kind of explosion, which led to a Nobel Prize in physics in 2000. So that's, that was another reason why supernovae are important. Because likely they're so bright that you can find them at the far edges of the observable universe. Now, earlier I talked about our Milky Way galaxy. And I've said that, yes, there's been supernovae that blew up in our Milky Way galaxy in the past. We haven't found something for the last few hundred years in our Milky Way galaxy. That would be a spectacular show. That would be beautiful. 
you'll be, you'll be able to see it in the daytime. If a star exploded in our galaxy, you will be able to see it even in the daytime. That's how bright it's going to be because it's going to be so close to us. Now, that has to happen over the last few hundred years. But it happened in the distant past. And if you go back and look at the same places where a star, a supernova, exploded a few hundred or a few thousand years ago, this is what it looks like today. This is the, the ashes from a supernova explosion. We call this a supernova remnant, the remnant from the explosion. And if you carefully look at this, you will notice the morphology is not as round as you would expect it to be, right? Because in your imagination, you might think of uh, stars as very round spherical balls of light. Well, when those very round spherical balls of light explode, they produce something that's very messy and very, as asymm very asymmetric. You see a lot of filament structure. You see it's elongated. kind of looks like a football. It's pretty weird shape. And I'll show you some more. This is the Crab Nebula. We call it all. This is called the Crab Nebula. I'll show you some more pictures of supernova remnants. This is another one. It's very pretty. Cassiopeia. Now, let me tell you this. A lot of the books you look at, the illustrations in the books you read about astronomy, or something you see on TV about astronomy, you see this beautiful picture with the colors, the blue, the red. Let me tell you this. If you look at this thing with your regular telescope without any filter, it's not going to look like this. It's not going to look red, green, and blue. The reason that we produce this composite image in astronomy when we're looking at these things is because we use different filters to look at different, different colors of a supernova. Because it turns out that each color has a different property. Bluer colors come from something that's hotter. Redder colors come from something that's cooler in temperature. So if you use different filters, you can figure out, you can decompose a temperature map of your supernova remnant. So the blue regions would be the hottest stuff, and the redder regions would be the cooler stuff. That's the reason that this looks the way it does in this picture. If you just go out there and look at it with your, with your telescope from Walmart or something, it's not going to look like this. Here's another one. This is called Tycho Supernova because a great Danish astronomer discovered it a few, year, a few hundred years ago, Tycho Brahe. And this is what it looks like today. This is a little bit more spherical, but it still has some weird features. Like, what's that bump up here? This is another one. This is a, com a complete and total mess, right? You've got something that's very elongated. Again, it looks like a football in shape. And if you zoom into the center, you see this weird disk and those jets that come out? What's going on there? It's funny how many times in science, when you look at something from, with a new perspective, with better technology, with better telescopes, you look at the details, and details matter. Details teach you something that you didn't know before. This is a perfect example of that, that supernova explosions are way more complicated than we always thought. If you actually look at them in detail, you will find a lot of weird features that uh, you wouldn't expect. In this particular case, what you see here essentially is what's left over from the explosion. Remember last time I told you the core of, uh, of the iron core of a massive star will go on and produce some really weird things like black holes or neutron stars. Down in the center, that's what you see here. It's, it's a newly born neutron star that was formed following the explosion. But what I've spent most of my career and my life working on is this particular kind of supernovae that we found only about 15 years ago by using robotic telescopes. So when I was a graduate student in the University of Texas at Austin back in uh, 2008, it was just two years. I got, I got there just two years after they found the first, the first one of this kind by using those robotic telescopes. And this particular type of supernovae were so bright, we never seen anything like it before in our lives, in our uh, scientific endeavors to understand supernovae. We've never seen anything like this before. That's why we call them superluminous supernovae. Lots of super words there. Superluminous supernovae. You got something that's up to a hundred or thousand times brighter than the brightest supernovae we've ever found up to that point. And there is a reason why we didn't find it before. 
And the reason why we didn't find it before is because we didn't look at the right place. It turns out, you know, logically you would think, okay, if you want to find supernovae, you have to look somewhere where there's a lot of stars because stars produce supernovae. So you got to look at galaxies or concentrations of galaxies that have millions of stars that produce a lot of supernovae. And that's what we did for years. But we didn't look in between in what we thought was empty space. We didn't look in between, and that's where those things were found. The superluminous supernova typically explode in really small galaxies, very dim galaxies. We call this dwarf galaxies that you would have usually ignored in the past, in between the big, bright, spiral galaxies like our own. That's why we didn't find them. And by using a robotic telescope that didn't care, it was completely unbiased. It said, I don't care about galaxies. I'm just going to take pictures of the entire sky. And it found those things in between, the superluminous supernova. Those are very rare, yet we find more and more of them now with our new technology. We have about 200 or so discovered since the first one, which was discovered in 2015. So over the last, uh, sorry, that should have been 2005. So over the last 14 years, we have only about 200 of these things found. Hopefully, with the next generation telescopes, like the one I told you about before, the half billion dollar project, the LSST, we'll find more of these things because they're extremely spectacular. Here's one example of what it looks like through a telescope. So if you point this telescope, this particular one actually happened in a normal galaxy. Most of them don't. But if you look at this picture, what you see here is a galaxy. That's a, the center of the galaxy. There is the spiral arms, kind of like our own galaxy. It's got giant spiral arms. And suddenly, off the center, on the north uh, east direction, boom, there's this really bright dot that appears out of nowhere. And it turns out, over the course of this, of this bright dot becoming brighter and brighter, the total amount of light that was emitted from this was more than the light that's emitted from the entire galaxy, from the hundreds of billions of stars that harbor this galaxy were dwarfed, completely dwarfed as compared to the total light emitted by one superluminous supernova. This is how bright, how spectacular those events are. Of course, when we found them, we're extremely baffled. Like, what is going on? There is still something about massive stars, about the universe. We don't understand what kind of uh, force of nature, if you may, or beast of nature might be the better word for it, produces these things. We've never seen anything like this before. So people like me, who are, well, I'm a theorist, I'm a theoretical astrophysicist, I'm using a lot of supercomputers to study the universe, to model the phenomena in the sky, and produce models that hopefully agree with the observations. So people like me were like, okay, we gotta figure this out. If we wanna have a complete understanding of massive stars and stellar death, we have to understand what kind of process produces superluminous supernovae. And then some people start thinking about what I showed you earlier, this thing. Some people start revisiting their idea about massive stars, where the old idea you had, you know, a massive star surrounded by empty space, but in this new idea, perhaps, a lot of massive stars, it turns out, they're surrounded by a lot of dirt, a lot of ashes that they themselves are ejecting in the years before the explosion. So I'm going to go back and show you one, one of my most, my favorite examples in the Milky Way galaxy. The Eta Carina Nebula. This is a spectacular thing. This is a Hubble Space Telescope pictures taken in 1995, 2001, and 2008. And as you can see, throughout the years, this thing is expanding. This, this uh, asymmetric bipolar shaped Nebula, bipolar shaped thing, is expanding in space. Down in the center, in the heart of this thing, turns out there's really massive stars. There's a, a pair of really massive stars. One of them is 50 times the mass of the sun. The other one is about 80 times the mass of the sun. 80 times the mass of the sun. Those are pretty massive stars. So what that teaches you is that the environments around massive stars can be extremely complicated. Massive stars are not generally surrounded by empty space. They're surrounded by things like this 
that we struggle to understand where they came from. They have to come from the star itself, because you can see it's expanding away over the years from the star, which also taught us something we didn't know about massive stars, which is that <clears throat> massive stars, towards the end of their lives, are undergoing some extremely <coughs> violent phenomena. The deaths, if you may, the death throes of massive stars are extremely violent themselves. The, st the star is beating like crazy and it's ejecting mass in an in a erratic <coughs> way before eventually it explodes as a supernova. And these ejections that the star undergoes in the last year in its geriatric age produce this beautiful bipolar nebula or any kind of nebula around it. I have more examples to show you, which will engulf the star. So when the star eventually actually blows up and dies, guess what? It's going to hit that material. It's going to interact with this material. Here's a few other examples. Of course, you've already seen this. This is Supernova 987A with this beautiful ring of, of material around it. You get another one you can see here. You have this giant bubble around this star. This is a really massive star surrounded by this bubble of material that is ejected, which when the star blows up, of course, it's going to interact with this. And then you have another example here. And what you can see from these pictures that we've taken with modern telescopes is that not only you have complicated environments around massive stars, but you also have a lot of diversity. Those environments do not look like one another. They're not spherical. Not, not all of them are spherical. Some of them are more spherical than others. Some of them are Total shape. Some of them are bipolar, like this one. The environments around massive stars are extremely complicated. And it turns out that this is really what affects the brightness of the explosion. The massive star explodes within something like this. It's destined to hit this material. And this massive interaction between the supernova acid, supernova ejecta, and this material will create these blast waves, these really bright blast waves, which will make everything hotter and brighter. Hotter usually means brighter. And that's how you can get a supernova to look super luminous. That's one of the, of the ways to do it. And that's kind of what I'm working on. I'm building computer models in uh, supercomputers here at LSU. Here at LSU, we like to call our supercomputers after Mike the Tiger. So we have Super Mike. That's one of the computers I'm using. And you can model a process like that with, uh, with a very expensive um, computer. Now, I want to pause here for a reality check. What I've been talking about the last 50 minutes keeps going back to the idea that nature is not, the stars are not spherical cows. Nature is three dimensional, you got three dimensions, and it can be extremely messy. The stars can have properties that when they actually blow up, they don't look spherical anymore. They look a complete mess. So this approximation of assuming a star is spherical and surrounded by, by clean, empty space is completely wrong. And it won't work if you want to understand superluminous supernova. To properly understand how the stars explode, the way they're interacting with this environment around them, and the way they become so bright is to model them, to produce simulations. Turns out that we're at a point right now in physics and science in general where we can't do the same thing that Albert Einstein did back in the 1920s, right? You can't, for a lot of things that you want to make predictions for, it's not good enough to just use pen and paper and write this beautiful theory and a bunch of equations and find a description. It's elegant, but it's not usually what happens now. What happens now is if you want to find an accurate model that reproduces the observations that you see, light curves, the brightnesses, the time scales that observers tell you they found, then you have to make a computer model. And within that computer model, you have to solve very complicated equations of physics that basically describe what happens when a massive star explodes and how light is uh, produced and, and all that kind of stuff. So you can't do it in pen and paper. If you want to be honest with yourself, you have to do it on a computer. Now, that is very expensive. Because there's a lot of computations you have to do when you produce a model. You have to break down your model in tiny little pieces and solve every equation for those pieces and then over a long period of time 
to see the ball. So notice this is not something you can do with your laptop, turns out, unfortunately, for the most part. That is why we use things like this. We call them supercomputers. This is the Mirror supercomputer, which is housed at the Argo National Laboratory outside of Chicago in Illinois. And it costs about $100 million to install. That's expensive. And it costs about a million, just the electric bill, to run it every year. Now, for people that have used a lot of computers, you notice that if you run a certain process, a heavy process, if you, if you play a video game in your laptop for a long time, your laptop gets warm, it gets warmer. Now imagine having something that's 100,000 times more powerful than your laptop running all the time in a room. It's pretty hot. So you need to cool this down. Otherwise, it's just gonna, the system is going to break down. You need to cool this down. You need to use air conditioning and powerful venting all the time. And that's why the electric bill is one million. On top of that, you have to add the amount of money you spend for support staff, for maintenance, and things like that. So those are very expensive to run. They're usually owned by either government laboratories that perform simulations for defense, sometimes a lot of defense research is going on on machines like this. But they're also in occasionally housed in academic institutions like LSU, where we use them for basic academic research. So to give you an example, it would take your, your laptop about 5,000 years to run a full three-dimensional realistic supernova simulation. For this machine, if you use the entire machine, it will take about three days. That's why we need supercomputers. And modeling, supercomputer modeling, is not something we just use in astronomy. You know, recently there was this uh, terrible hurricane, Dorian, and people were running models of this uh, in supercomputers. There's all kinds of things that people use supercomputers for, uh, for. all the way from finance to, uh, to biology to linguistics. This turns out to be the rule of the game if you want to push the envelope today. You have to use massive, powerful computers to do things that you cannot do on your own with your pen and paper. That's what we're using to understand supernova as well. There's a few more examples. It's Stampede. This is at the University of Texas at Austin. Another one is called Hopper. This is at the National uh, 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 Nuclear Science Institute. This is Oak Ridge. This is a Titan supercomputer. They're using it a lot for defense research. So they're simulating nuclear bombs and things like that, or weapons and stuff like that. So a lot of them are for pure academic research. Some of them are for other kinds of purposes. Now, what does a simulation look like of a supernova? This is a simulation that I've done, for example. And I'm not going to go into the details of what kind of parameters I'm showing here and so on and so forth. I only want to point out one thing. And that is, if you let a supernova explode, if you do put all the physics in and you produce the simulation and you make a movie out of it, make a prediction, uh, then what you see is that nothing is spherical anymore. This thing is extremely complicated. You get these large cyclonic motions going on and it gets completely messy in reality. Reality is messy. Reality is complicated. And multidimensional simulations like this one help us understand, just beginning to understand, how messy it is. But it turns out all this physics that goes on, if you do the problem right, is important in order to understand supernova. There's another one. This just focuses at the, at the, uh, the iron core of the star in the moments prior to explosion. I don't know why this didn't run. So this is just the core of the star. It's approximately 200 kilometers wide. And it again shows you that if you do the entire physics correctly, what you get out of the supernova explosion is not this beautiful spherical outward explosion. You get this really complicated mess, which then leads to something like the supernova remnant that I showed you before, something like this. If you do everything correctly, you might get a better answer. So, let's go to the key question of the, of, the, of, the, of the presentation, which is, you might be wondering, okay, you're telling us there's a lot of massive stars in the Milky Way galaxy. We haven't seen an explosion for the last few hundred years. We're actually overdue. Our, our Milky Way galaxy is overdue for a supernova explosion. It might happen, hopefully, in your lifetimes. 
Uh, but then the question comes up, should we defend ourselves? Can a supernova explosion wipe out the human civilization? So to answer this, you got to understand, OK, how much energy, and I told you about this earlier, how much energy is produced during a supernova explosion versus how far away it is. Because it turns out most massive stars are really far away. They're not a threat. There's a few of them that are nearby, but they're still not quite a threat. So I wouldn't lose my sleep tonight over this. However, there is one star which we all know and love. I'm actually writing a paper on this star uh, th around this time, which is called Bill Juice. Many of you may have seen the old movie with Bill Juice. This is a different kind of Bill Juice. This is uh, one of the brightest stars in the constellation of Orion, or the Hunter. If you look at the north sky, and you can actually see from Baton Rouge, you will see this very distinct constellation with three stars going upwards like a belt, a body, and legs. This is the Orion Hunter from the ancient Greek mythology. And this star in the upper left part of the hunter, it's quite red. If you focus your eyes on this star, you will distinctly see that it's got a red color. This is Betelgeuse, and it turns out it's a star that's about 15 or 20 times more massive than the, star, than the sun, so it's going to blow up as a supernova. On top of this, it's really old. It's approaching the end of its life, which means that this supernova would happen potentially soon. Now, when I use the term soon in astronomical terms, I don't mean tomorrow or in 100 years. Maybe it will take 100,000 years, but that's a short time for astronomical phenomena. If you think that the age of the universe is 14 billion years, 100,000 years is nothing. It's a blinking of an eye. So this uh, Betelgeuse, this star, is not far away from us. Uh, it's about 427 light years away, which means it takes light, which is the fastest thing in the universe, 427 years to reach us from Betelgeuse, which is not far compared to other stars. And it could actually explode. And if it explodes, great. You will see a beautiful show in the night and the day sky. You will, you will actually be able to see it during the daytime. But it won't harm us. For a supernova to harm us, it's got to be within about 50 light years from the Earth. And it's not going to directly harm us. It's not going to directly impact the Earth and wipe everything out. What it's going to do is it's going to wipe out the ozone layer, which means that we're going to be exposed to the ultraviolet radiation of the sun, and that's eventually what's going to kill life. It's not the supernova directly. It's the effect of the supernova to the Earth's atmosphere. It's going to destroy ozone and expose us to the ultraviolet radiation. But again, I wouldn't lose my sleep over it because, A, there's not too many massive stars close enough to us to actually cause trouble. So I just want to summarize with really why do we care? I want to go back to my opening question of this talk, which is, OK, I study supernova. There's things that come and go, massive stars that blow up, that produce all of us. Why do we care after all? There are several reasons that I think are important for why we do this, kind of important. First of all, as I said, supernovae are produced by massive stars. And those are some of the few places in the universe that are hot and dense enough to produce the elements around us that we see and, and love. Gold is produced, uh, a lot of these things. So to understand how different elements are produced and different materials are produced, we have to understand how supernova takes place, because that's where they're formed. That's where they're forged. Now, the other thing is that they're really bright. Supernova are some of the most the brightest phenomena in the night sky, which means that you can see them really far away, which means that you can understand the properties of the universe itself, because you find something that's billions of light years away, and you can actually see it, and you can measure how far away it is, and you can understand the properties of the universe in these unprecedented distances. The other reason is because they help us understand better the lives of stars. It turns out, as I told you towards the second part of my talk, Mass around stars is very messy, it's very complicated. We didn't know that for a long time. Turns out it's important. So through supernova, we can understand the environment and lives of massive stars, which is something we thought we understood a few decades ago, but we still don't quite get. There's another, I would say, real life example of why should we care about supernova. Because I've talked to you 
Throughout my talk, I pointed to artificial intelligence and machines that we're using to analyze all these massive amounts of data that we're going to get from, from the next generation telescopes like LSD. And in the process of learning about supernovae, we innovate. We create new algorithms to model the explosions. We create new computing techniques, artificial intelligence, software. A lot of that software, believe it or not, ends up having some sort of industrial application. A lot of our students in physics and astronomy decide, hey, I don't want to be in academia anymore. I want to go to industry and make $200,000 a year. And they can do it because they've gained the skills from studying supernovae by running computing simulations and programs and uh, artificial intelligence. They can actually do it and get really nice pay for it. So with that, I want to summarize and I want to thank you for your attention. We do have a question from Facebook Live. What is machine learning exactly? Very nice. Okay, so let's just try to analyze the term itself. Machine learning. It implies that you're teaching a computer to learn in itself. So, and how do you do that? Think about daily life. You know, our daily experiences growing up is that looking at things and being able to separate a dog from a cat, a tree from a bird. We learn our brains over time, they look at a lot of data, and they learn how to do it. In the same way, if you teach a computer to look through data, through a lot of data, it can actually start recognizing patterns. And this is what machine learning is. It's teaching a computer to be able, by itself, to identify patterns in data. Yes? So the elements in our solar system, are we from one supernova? Several supernovas, or what are we from? That what is are we a, created from? That's a wonderful question. So it turns out our sun is a second generation star. How do we know that? Because we can actually observe the sun. It's pretty close. We can do really high quality observations of the sun. And we can figure out what the sun is made of. And if you don't have supernovae, the universe only seeds you with the two most simple and boring elements, mainly hydrogen and helium. So if you look at the sun and you find something else other than hydrogen and helium, you find you know, carbon, oxygen, lithium. As a matter of fact, you can look in geology, you can look at rocks in the earth and measure how much uranium do I have, how much plutonium do I have, things like that. And then you compare that to what you find when you look at a supernova, it matches pretty well, which means that there had to be a supernova that happened a long time ago in our neighborhood that seeded, that seeded the space with this heavier material which then formed the sun in the solar system, essentially blocking in that pre-existing material that we can actually measure today. So it turns out, you know, we use uranium for uh, nuclear power plants. Uranium is one of the few things you can only get in a supernova. Actually. There's no other way to make uranium. And we find it here. We mine it. Any other questions? Don't be shy. I want some young people to ask me questions. I'm not a scary high school teacher. Yes. <laughs> Can you repeat your question? I couldn't hear. Whenever you measure the distance from Earth to the star, you measure the center of the Earth or wherever the. You know, the distances to stars are so immense and so great that. The difference it makes between the Earth and the, uh, 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 the surface of the Earth and the center is minuscule. Like, you know, if you measure something that's millions of times away as the radius of the, of the Earth itself, what does million plus one so that do? I mean, obviously we're measuring from the from the surface because that's what we have with telescopes and our equipment. But again, the difference is, is minuscule, so it doesn't really affect the number. Yes. Um, if you measure stuff like supernova and stars from light years, how can we measure light years if we don't know how fast light goes? We do know how fast light goes. As a matter of fact, we've measured how fast light goes back in the 1700s. There was another uh, Dutch astronomer back in the day who was looking at Jupiter, you know, the planet Jupiter. 
So it turns Jupiter has some really big moons. You know, the Earth has a moon. Jupiter has many moons. And there's four moons of Jupiter that are very big. You can actually see them with your binoculars. If you have binoculars, find Jupiter and look at them. You can see four dots in front of Jupiter. So by looking at Jupiter and its moons, it turns out that they eclipse Jupiter at different times. When Jupiter is closer to us, you see those eclipses sooner. When Jupiter is far away from us, you see those eclipses later, which means that it takes a different time for light to see the eclipse, you gotta measure the light, to see that eclipse, depending on how close Jupiter is. So that was the first time that an astronomer figured out, okay, light travels with a certain constant speed, and that's about 300,000 kilometers per second. And we do it very, very regularly night. right now. We've done it to really high precision in modern laboratories. We know it at really great precision. Does that answer your question? Okay. Yes? Yes, yeah, that's okay. Wow. Where's your physics degree? Uh, so hypernova, that's a very good question. So hypernova turns out are slightly different than superluminous supernova. They're not quite the same. It turns out that uh, a lot of the stars, you know, you look at the sun, it's actually rotating. The sun is rotating around its axis. A lot of massive stars are doing the same. They're dancing around their own axis. They're not just sitting there and just go like this. So some of these massive stars rotate so fast, really, really fast. They're spinning around themselves so fast that when they actually blow up, they produce an, an even more massive explosion that is not quite round. Because if you have something spinning and then it blows up, it more or less looks like this. It looks very elongated because of the effects of rotation. And if you happen to look at it through that axis, then it looks super bright. That's what hypernova are essentially. They come from fast rotating massive stars. So rotation is the other thing that causes them to be right. Great question. Emma, you had a question? Yes, um, another Facebook Live question. Can you do a telescope supernova survey that predicts where a supernova will be beforehand using machine learning? Wow, that's, that's a great question. Well, the answer is, uh, when we have things like the LSST out there, we will have enough data because we'll find one million transients a night, approximately. So we will have enough data to make better predictions. Right now, we have some idea, but with more data, that's what machine learning is about. Give me more data, and I'll learn more. So with more data in the future, we'll be able to make better predictions. We don't quite currently have that capability yet. We can just talk about possibilities, however. We can say it's quite possible. There's a few really old stars, massive old stars in this galaxy. It's quite possible one of them was going to go off. So you can talk probabilistically, but in the future we'll get that. Predictive, we'll get that. Um, so according to what I know, it's called Kenmay. Uh, the element from hydrogen to iron, to iron uh, through nuclear fusion. So yes. where does the energy come from to make the heavy Very nice question, great question. So uh, as you said, massive stars like core collapse supernovae will only make up to iron. So how do you get uranium and plutonium and things that are carrying the iron? Well, it turns out that after the explosion, there's two ways to do this, it turns out. After the explosion, the radiation that's emitted from the supernova, because there's a lot of radioactivity that's formed, the radiation that's emitted from the supernova is powerful enough to start even uh, put it, pushing together even heavier elements. So the supernova itself will make uranium not the star before it dies. The supernova itself can make uranium. However, recently we discovered another, even more important source of this really heavy material. And that is when you have two extreme stars that are dancing around together that actually merge, they collide. Neutron stars, if you want me to give you the, the term, you have two neutron stars that come together and collide. The explosion and the conditions of matter, the temperature, the density, are so incredibly high that you can immediately form uranium and plutonium and all kinds of heavy elements. Um, and we call those kilonova. And as a matter of fact, Louisiana plays a, a huge role into discovering these things because I don't know how many people in the room have been to LIGO. Oh, great. That's wonderful. They probably played in the Science Museum. It's this beautiful facility. LIGO, a few years ago, of course, discovered gravitational waves, which is these ripples in space and time that are produced 
when uh, extreme objects like black holes and neutron stars are dancing around each other to the point of merging. So we were able to find neutron stars colliding with LIGO and then look at them with a the telescope and say, wait a second, there's a lot of plutonium, uranium coming out of this. So there's another way for nature to do this as well. So that was a great question. Thank you. questions? So maybe we can pause here and if some of you have still questions, like you can talk to Manos personally. The next talk will be on September 28th. It will take you before the Big Bang. It will tell you the story about the Big Bang. Thank you all for